I believe that communication is a gift. This is my mum, who gave birth to me and my twin sister in 1976. At the age of 23, my mum had a major stroke when she was 48 years old. She was in a coma for three months. She was given a 1% chance of survival. My family had to face the decision of whether to turn the machine off. We chose not to. Miraculously, my mum is alive today. But it came at a cost. Since then, my mum has remained severely brain damaged and unable to speak. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful that she is still alive today. Not many others have been as fortunate. But for the last 23 years, I haven't been able to have a two-way conversation with my mum. It's no surprise to me that I have spent my entire career in, the commu in communications. I understand why it really matters. And that's why, for me, I believe that communications is a gift. So thank you for allowing me to share that gift with you today. Today I'd like to talk to you about a specific set of skills. One that I believe is really relevant to the world of work today. But before I do that, I have a very quick question. A group of children were asked by their teacher to start a story using the most exciting word that they can imagine. I'd like you to do the same yourself. They were given a five-second head start. Have you got your word yet? Now, many people who've done this exercise have come up with the same word as three-quarters of those children came up with. And that word was suddenly. Now, it's a great word, don't get me wrong. But is it really the most exciting word that you can imagine? Now, there was one boy in this exercise who came up with something new, something different. And that word was kablammy. <laughs> the three exclamation marks are really important, by the way. So why am I telling you that? It's because the boy who came up with this word was dyslexic. He came up with a new way of looking at the exercise. He came up with a new word. Now, I know what you're thinking. Kablammy isn't a real word. But that's the point. He came up with a word, the best word that he could imagine. And the way he thinks is because he has a differently wired brain. And he came up with a unique idea that counters groupthink. And it came, comes up with unexpected moments. And that's why I call these unexpected moments of lateral thinking Kablammy moments. So ask yourself, when was the last time that you thought differently? When was the last time that you had your own Kablammy moment? My invitation to you today is that I would like to boldly redefine dyslexia for the modern age. And I would like you to invite dyslexic thinking into your organizations, not because it's the right thing to do, it's because it will make your organizations better. First, I'd like to tell you my story. So, up until the age of six, I grew up in Kenya with my twin sister and my elder brother. It was a very happy childhood. I used to remember trying to pretend to be a superhero with a cape, flying around, normal kind of kid. At the age of six, I transitioned into the UK education system. It was quite a shock. I started to realize that 
I was a bit different. I couldn't read and write as well as my twin sister. I found it difficult to work through the math problems. I found it difficult to retain the facts. It was as if my superhero was in the presence of kryptonite. And my teacher's reports would say, Richard must try harder. And they put me forward for special needs support to do extra learning for my learning disability. And it is at that point that I thought my story was started to be written. One that I would, sadly, for a period of time, start to believe that I was in some way mentally subnormal. Now, I have developed coping strategies that I use through all of my life. And those include verbalizing my ideas really quickly. I still write in capital letters. I use rhymes to remember facts. But I also learned when I was young not to tell anybody about my dyslexia. I told myself I needed to work twice as hard to be as good as anybody else. Because I was in a system that favored exams over ideas. Now, most people know what dyslexia is, and they assume it is just about having numbers and letters all jumbled up. That's why, if you invite a group of dyslexics to a toga party, don't be surprised if they turn up dressed as a goat. <laughs> so whilst the challenges are well known, what is less well known is the skills that they actually bring. And to understand that, we first of all have to understand the neuroscience behind dyslexia. We all have something in our brain called the cortex. And inside the outer layer of our brain, we have these little things called mini columns. They're like telephone poles for the brain. And between these telephone poles, there is something called axons. Now, dyslexic's axons are far apart. And that brings significant cognitive advantages. It means dyslexics have a differently wired brain that allows them to process information really quickly. It also allows them to have look at a situation and identify patterns and narrative. And a real common trait of dyslexia is the ability to see the bigger picture. So they see things in unique, divergent ways. And they're well, uh, they get well prepared to be able to solve complex problems with unique insight. It is my fundamental belief that great minds think unalike. Just think of the incredible innovations, ideas, and creativity that these individuals have brought to society, whether it's Henry Ford, Alexander Graham Bell, Thomas Edison, John Lennon, Steve Jobs, Muhammad Ali. These individuals are, or are reported to have been, dyslexic. They have created breakthrough ideas that have changed our society for good. And it's no wonder that GCHQ, the UK department that is responsible for keeping the UK safe, has actively recruited for neurodiversity over the last 100 years. Now, this gentleman was the first head of GCHQ, and his name was Alistair Dennison. And he really recognized the benefits of different points of view. He invited innovative thinking in since the 1920s. He knew he needed to invite people in who could connect ideas, who could think visually, who could use their intuition, see patterns that others couldn't, in essence, to help them connect up the dots. Now, why does that visionary approach matter? Because he created the context for people like Alan Turing to decipher the Enigma code which brought the end of the Second World War quicker and changed the course of history. Now, statistically speaking, according to Dyslexia International, one in five people have dyslexia. Now, that means that 20% of people in this room and in every single classroom 
have dyslexia. The tragic thing is that according to the same report, that only 80% or less, uh, the 80% of people in, the, in, that, in that room, those children, aren't identified as dyslexic. That's because 91% of those teachers aren't specifically trained to identify those traits. This is leading to more children being marginalized and excluded from that system of education that favors the written word and text over creative ideas and innovation. So why does it matter? That's been the same all along, hasn't it? What's really changed? Well, it's because we are living in the age of the machine. Manpower Talent Solutions, in 2021, wrote a report about the rise of automation. And they found this staggering statistic that by 2025, humans and machines will split the work they do 50% by the machines and 50% of the humans. Now, that's a scary statistic. And we can see, in the advent of the fourth industrial revolution, the world of work being digitized. But what's fascinating, of the 50% of the human skills that are needed for the future of work, a large proportion of those skills are what dyslexic thinkers are really good at. So something exciting is happening. The stigma is being changed. And many companies are now recognizing dyslexic thinking as a valuable skill set to have in their organization. In the Ernst & Young, or EY, report called The Value of Dyslexia, they talked about the changing workforce have, and needing dyslexic thinkers who had exactly the right skills for the jobs of tomorrow. And fascinatingly, the skills that dyslexics find challenging is actually in decline. In the age of automation, where facts can be Googled, where punctuation, spelling, and grammar can be corrected at a touch of a button. It is creativity, intuition, imagination, and empathy that is what the machines can't deliver. Which is why dyslexic thinkers are fit for purpose for the 21st century mindset. Now, according to the World Economic Forum for the Future, and also a report by Made by Dyslexia, there are six dyslexic thinking skill sets that are specifically mapping directly to what is needed for the future of work. And those skill sets are this. Visualizing, interacting with spaces and different ideas. Imagining, original thinking. Communication, crafting clear and coherent messages. Reasoning, finding patterns, connecting, empathizing, and influencing people, and exploring, being curious about the world around you. So how am I using dyslexic thinking in what I do? I'm very grateful to have had a 25-year career in the creative and digital industry, an industry that has not only embraced, but been enhanced by my dyslexic thinking. And I use that dyslexic thinking every day in the consultancy that I created. I went so far as to call the name with a spelling mistake intentionally in it. And we actively recruit for neurodiversity because we know that it helps solve difficult to solve challenges for complex organizations. We see strength in neurodiverse difference because we genuinely believe that great mites think unalike. And I've used that dyslexic thinking in the um, not-for-profit uh, social uh, enterprise that I set up during the pandemic. I've been helping young creative talent, many of whom come from a neurodiverse background, to get in and get on in the digital and creative industry. I'm very proud of the support that we've been giving to neurodiverse young people. This initiative has picked up numerous awards, but that's not what really matters. What really matters is that we managed to change young people's lives when it mattered the most. We gave them hope. We can all do something to help. So to all the dyslexics in the room, I want you to remember this. 
You have a learning difference, not a learning disability. There is no barrier to what you can achieve and the impact you can create in society. Follow the footsteps of those incredible divergent thinkers and make a difference in the world around you. To everyone else, I have a simple task. Find a way to recognize, leverage, nurture dyslexic thinking in your organization. And there are many things you could do, but this is the simplest thing you can do. When somebody comes to you with an alternative perspective, and you use the words, that's a great idea, but just try and catch yourself. It limits the opportunity for dyslexic thinkers to shine. It marginalizes fresh ideas and approaches. Simply change the language to, that's a great idea, and. It invites us into the thinking process. It increases the opportunity for those kablammy moments. And for those who want to do more, you may be interested to know that Richard Branson, Virgin, LinkedIn, Dictionary.com, and Made by Dyslexia have just in this last month launched the Dyslexic Thinking Campaign, where they're encouraging people with dyslexia to add dyslexic thinking as a positive skill to have on their online CV. Why? Because the tech companies of tomorrow, Google, Facebook, um, uh, Apple, and even the likes of EY and GCHQ are actively recruiting for this skill. So if you see a dyslexic thinker who has dyslexic thinking on their LinkedIn profile, like I do, do them the huge honor and connect with them and endorse them for the skill. Because you will be helping to celebrate and normalize dyslexic thinking and helping to change that narrative. So what is the future that I hope for? I would like us to radically redefine dyslexic thinking for the modern world. And Albert Einstein summed it up with this beautiful quote. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. I want us to celebrate the gift of intuitive mindset. I want us to build a social movement of people to empower limitless uh, thinking that allows the dyslexic thinkers into organization and education. I want them to create a space for them to thrive. Now, they say you have, with a, uh, your TED Talk, you want to speak to a number of people in the room and give them their one thing that you want them to remember for the rest of their lives. So to my mum, who is here today, I want to say thank you for the gift of dyslexia. If you could speak today, I know you'd be very proud. And to my dad, who has been my mum's carer for the last 23 years, uncomplainingly, I want to say thank you for showing us what the vows mean when they say in sickness and in health. But you remember the boy that said kablammy? Well, he was my son, and his name is Rafi. Rafi, I know you'll be watching this talk someday in the future. I know you struggle with the same things that I do, but I know that you will grow up in an age that is increasingly recognizing dyslexic thinking and the superpowers that you have. You are more than the words that you find difficult to spell. And to my other children, Elodie and Monty and Rafi, I'd say bring your gifts and strengths to whatever you do. And to all the dyslexic thinkers in the room, I just want you to remember this one thing. Your brain is uniquely wired for the 21st century. Dyslexic thinking is not a disadvantage, but a much sought after skill that is in demand for the future of work. It needs to be recognized, nurtured, included in our workplaces and our educational systems. And if we do that, it will lead to even more kablammy moments. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate your time today. It's been an honor to speak to you today and for us to share what it truly means to be human together.